Hello, Melissa. Hi. You have a very fancy background right now. Well, or chaotic. It depends, <laughs> it depends on your viewpoint. You know, we'll dive into that in a minute, right? So, um, I I live in chaos. Yeah, they call me the agent of chaos around here. So, you know. Um, <laughs> but around here is the Needlepoint Clubhouse. I am Megan Holmes. I own the Needlepoint Clubhouse here right outside of the city of St. Louis. And then together with this lady next to me with all of that fabric behind her is... Yes. Um, I'm Melissa McLeod here at the Wool and the Floss in Gross Point, Michigan, just outside of Detroit. And currently I am in my shop. The last time I recorded from this room, somebody asked me if I was in a closet. Um, <laughs> And having been in your finishing <laughs> room, as well as my finishing room, they are a little closet-like because we cram so much supplies in there that, um, yeah. And so I thought, well, I'll just film right in front of some of our stacks of fabric and our trims and all that. So, And the reason you're doing that, for putting yourself in a closet, is not because we just want to show off that fancy closet, but it's because we are going to talk about finishing today. Uh, first of all, I think it's exciting that we're back together again. We do this, what, oh maybe gosh, maybe once a month, the two of us yeah. together-ish. Um, but it's a lot of fun when we get back together. Typically, we have a guest on the other side that we may or may not know, uh, and we are meeting them, but we definitely know each other and we've done this a lot and it's a lot of fun when we're back together. So I'm so glad because I feel like I, I miss you. We, um, normally, I mean, this is a total aside, but, um, normally our lives allow us to either see each other or at least talk fairly frequently. And I feel like we haven't even had a chance to like take a breath and say hi to each other in the last month. So um, I'm glad to see you. I know. I'm glad to see you too. So we are so lucky to have a marketing consultant helping us uh -huh. out. I guess what's, that's what we call her, right? A marketing consultant. Works and um, her name is Rebecca. She's amazing. And she had a really good idea that I'm not quite sure why either of us hadn't come up with, or maybe we had, and we just never had time to actually we just never had time. implement it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Rebecca suggested to us that we um, take questions from the audience, essentially, and so, uh, what was it? Maybe two weeks ago, or I don't know. Time's flying by. I don't even know yeah. what difference does it difference does it make. We put out a request to have uh, listeners give us some ideas for what they wanted to hear in the podcast, and we got so many good ones. Um, but today we're gonna we're gonna talk about the first one. So, do you want to introduce the topic yeah. and the person who asked the question? Sure. So, I think Rebecca collected ideas like. Um, for what we're calling a mail mailbag episode. So you'll see those in the future. Um, but they were also like, give us ideas for an entire podcast if you have one. So um, Kelly Watley, who is from Texas, mm. um, asked us, I, I was like, I think she's one of your customers as well. Mer Megan Love and Kelly. I are very fortunate to share many, many, many customers. Um, and uh, she said, I'd love to hear about finishing from the shop owner's point of view, because I think there's probably more to it than most stitchers realize. And I was like, oh, Kelly, <laughs> yes, you get it. You're asking both the million dollar question and um, really the topic that I prefer not to talk about. I know. So <laughs> we, um, you know, to, to put it all out there, Megan and I said our biggest challenge with this episode is try to just try to stay happy and upbeat because finishing is such an important part of the needlepoint process, but it's so labor intensive for the shop owner. And um, we uh, just have a lot of, um, sorry, someone just walked in and distracted me a little Distra bit. Yeah, um, that's all right. Uh, so there's just, there's just a lot that goes along with it. And it's such, um, I mean, we're taking in people's babies practically, you know, I hate, I hate to compare it to a human, but I think people, when they drop off their finishing, sometimes feel like they're giving away their child, especially if it's a large project and they're nervous to have somebody else be caring for that. I mean, it, there's some similarities let's and just it's, say. and it's okay you know I call it you you I forget what you just said just now but I call it the life cycle of a needlepoint yes. piece I feel like yes. we have to we have to finalize the life cycle of the needlepoint piece in order for people to be able to dive into a new project and I think I've said this before maybe on this podcast definitely here in this store when I first opened my shop I said I'm not doing finishing <laughs> and the owners, the people, who, the women who I was buying the shop from said, I don't really think you can do that. And I said, oh, yeah, no, this is far too terrifying to me. It's a lot of um, liability. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of labor. And I'm just not doing it. And I very, very quickly realized that that is 
kind of not really an option. Um, yeah. And that you have to help stitchers sort of make a full circle effort with their projects. And, um, and it is joyful. There is a lot, a lot of joy in delivering a finished product to a stitcher. Maybe it's their first project. Maybe it was their, you know, grandmother's first project that they're refixed, they're, you know, refinishing. Um, there's a lot, a lot of joy in it, but there's also just a lot of strain because I mean, well, we're going to get into the details, but yeah. So we're, we will talk about the life cycle, but I will bring up one other thing that our Rebecca shared with us the other day. And I, I am remiss in not remembering who made this comment, but a, a watcher, a podcast watcher from the West side of the state of Michigan commented. She's like, I'm so confused about this finishing thing. Um, she said, when I was a young girl and I learned how to needlepoint, you started by needlepointing and you finished it by finishing the item yourself. Like she said, I didn't even realize there were professional finishers out there. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to throw that out there because there, there are lots of things that have been created in this industry designed for self-finishing, meaning mm -hmm. very easy to complete yourself. Um, but the original self-finishing is, and I think we talked about this a little bit. Remember, uh, was it like a year and a half ago, we found that I found the bag of stuff at my mom's house <laughs> yes, and it had yes. the vintage directions on how to finish something. And we're like, oh, like it was really simple and easy then. But just like everything else in our world, I think improvements have been put on it and it's been elevated and you can absolutely positively learn how to finish yourself. But there are professional finishers out there that that is all they do and they have um, perfected the art of it. And it is definitely an art. Um, and so, you know, you have a choice. You can learn to finish yourself. Hallelujah. Megan and I commend you. Um, but we are, most shops are here to take in your finishing. There are also finishers that work independently of shops. Um, but we're here to talk about what happens in the shop. So that's right. Step one, a customer finishes their needlepoint and they say, I don't want to finish this myself. What do I do? So we have finishing forms on our website. I'm assuming you do as well, right? We do. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and ours, and again, I should also preface this all with the fact that Megan and I said earlier, why are we doing this? We should have our finishing managers doing this because we know enough to be dangerous. Yeah. You know, I but, think that just really quickly, um, it, we determined that this was such an important piece of the business after I said I wasn't doing it anymore, um, that we actually both have hired people to focus all on finishing because it's just such an important piece of the business. And so um, I like to work by committee and I just like to hear when things, you know, need to come my way. And so I am not really in the weeds. And so I might right. screw things up. Lauren just walked through, in fact, and I'm hoping she doesn't stick around and listen to too much of this because she's going to wince. Uh, say yes. hello, Lauren. I already, um, I already warned Kirsty that I would probably only say about 90% of this right and I'd say something right. wrong, but 90% is a pretty good stat. But, it's but an let A me, minus. So. Let me give us a little bit more of a pat on the back though. We know a little bit more than the average uh, person does. And the, uh, the intention sure. of this podcast is to educate the average stitcher on some things that are going on in the industry. So away yes. we go. <laughs> so I'm fortunate that I do have a full-time finisher who actually worked for the shop before I even owned it. Oh and um, she's amazing. Um, we have a whole team of finishers. I know you do as well. I um, tried to count them up. I think I have 20 different individuals that I work with with finishing, depending on what the type of finish is. And yeah. I and I, I, I'm way. about the same. In fact, um, because Melissa and I have been such a uh, long time industry friends, we actually do share a couple of finishers. For sure. Um, and that's been a blessing to me because you had some that I didn't know about. I, I don't know if I shared the wealth back to you, to be frank. <laughs> I'm um, going to keep track. <laughs> I know you should. But, um, but the other piece of that is, is sometimes um, shop owners don't, intentionally do this but they sort of keep their finishing people secret and part well, of that it's, it's like when you were when you had little kids and you still do have little kids you didn't give out the names of your best babysitters, babysitters. <laughs> because they wouldn't have room for you on saturday night so that's a it's great, a little bit the same thing that's a I'm great sorry. analogy that's a great analogy but um but also 
a lot of these people are operating in their homes and they're just people. Right. And, you know, we've had people come to the store and say, well, I want to, I want to go talk to your finisher. And I'm like, I'm not giving out her phone number. This lady is like yeah. in her home down the street and she doesn't want the, the reason why she's doing this job is because she doesn't want to interface with the public. She's right. doing this job for me because that's our job. But anyway, so well, and most yeah, of it our feels finishers... like this weird secret thing that I, I, I hate that about our industry because we really are a very collaborative industry. But um, a lot of that is just to protect uh, privacy and to pe protect pipeline, really. Right, right. And um, many of my finishers are either retirees. They get up at like five in the morning and they work until noon and then they go about their retiree world. Yes. And um, another handful are moms with little tiny kids. And they might not start working until 730 at night and work until midnight, you know, be because it's it was kind of one of the first work at home industries, honestly, like, you know, like before COVID, these finishers were working out of their houses and working remotely. Now yeah. that's super common, but it wasn't prior to 2020. So yes. Um, yes. So, and most of them are 1099 employees, sorry, financial girl coming out, not W2 employees. So contract so they, workers, essentially. they're independent yep. contractors. We don't control what they do. We it's, it's piecework. We send along their projects they send them back when they're done. We're not controlling every step of the way, although we are helping to um, collaborate with them, help them through things that are get tricky. Um, I'm jumping way ahead in all of this, but you know, quality control at the end. If there are issues, um, you know, we, my finishing manager, your finishing manager will roll back to them and say, "Oh, this needs to be tweaked," so etc. So. Back to the life cycle. Sorry. Um, <laughs> well, I was trying to decide if I should jump in, but I thought, I think, I think we need to back up just a teensy bit, right? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, we, so when someone finishes their piece, they're going to either deliver it to their local needlepoint shop, or they're going to ship it because many people um, don't have a local needlepoint shop. I feel like Meg and I are very fortunate to have a number of customers that we are their local needlepoint shop, even if they live thousands of miles away. Um, so when things come into our shop, um, and I'll just tell you what we do, and then you can say yes, no, how you do it differently. Um, our mail arrives every day, um, UPS, FedEx. USPS. USPS, regular old boring mail. And some days we get two packages, some days we get 30 packages. And, you know, some of it's not finishing, much of it is finishing. So we set aside all the finishing uh, boxes, we open them up, someone sits down at a computer and sends all of those individuals an email saying your uh, patriarch ornament and your Christmas tree stand up have both arrived safely in the house. We will be back in touch when we get to the processing point of view if we have any questions. Yep. So Our process is similar and I imagine that both you and I um, have processes that are either the same or derivative of our, our friends who own other shops. Um, right. The idea is that when we receive something, we try very hard to be in touch with you to let you know that it arrived. I think that's what you're trying to get at. So yes, we make a phone stressful. call. Mm -hmm. Stressful to put your your things you've worked on for years or a year or three months in the mail and just a hope and a prayer that it gets there safely. I will say we, and this is something we were going to get into, we at any point in time of anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 pieces under management and I think you're a similar number. I, I am. In fact, I asked the girls this, the girls, that's rude, condescending. The women who manage the area of my business, our business. Um, Those and, girls are mainly older than you, but yeah, by the that's way, exactly anyway. right. That's exactly right. We call them the, <laughs> the clubhouse gals. So I have to apologize if that came across as being condescending and I did not intend that. So anyhow, um, the, 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 my colleagues who uh, process the finishing. Yes. So right now we, it was like 1936, I think is what was on the spreadsheet. Um, yeah. give or and take it, it because varies, obviously exactly right. So, um, so if you think about that, that's a lot, it is a lot. <laughs> and we, and if I think about um, it too much, I can't sleep at night. So let's no, not do it, that, it's, but <laughs> it's, it's, um, humbling <laughs> and terrifying all at the same time. We had, and I, if anyone has followed along with the wool and the floss for very long, I think it was about two years ago, there were terrible floods in Gross Point. Oh God. Like everyone's basement, thankfully I was spared. Everyone's basement had water like six feet high, four feet high. And we don't have a basement in our building. Um, the first thing I did 
as soon as like I had was done processing that is we had things on like shelves in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll, and I'll, I'll post pictures for the promo so you guys will see it. We have all our finishing that's being stored in the building and we'll get into why that is um, on shelves that are like literally seven feet in the air. I'm yes. like, I'm getting them as high off the ground as humanly possible because it's so much liability on our part and these things cannot be easily recreated. We know this. Um, right. So we do everything in our power. Um, I've seen your finishing room. I know you as well um, to make sure that everything, once it arrives in the building is logged, stored as safely as humanly possible. So that's right. So, so to your point, so we, we, we contact you to let you know that we've gotten it. We, um, make for us, what we do is we, we do one phone call. So I, you're smart to do that email. Cause it buys you a little bit of time on the other side, well, but we try to call like get it's, the, it's yeah. in writing because yeah, that's right. we're all human and we have, um, as you do a large number of employees in the shop. And so uh -huh. it's just a way, like, I can't tell you how many times we go back to look at the email to say, Oh no, that Susie Q thinks they sent us a baby sleeping sign. I'm looking back through all her emails. We never got a baby sleeping sign. Gotcha. She must have us confused with the clubhouse or something yeah. like that. <laughs> that happens all the time. Um, but yeah, so so we um, let you know we got it. We uh, write up all of the details per the specifications of the customer. Ours then goes into this little purgatory bin that sits because we're processing them and it goes in a bin. That bin is then brought back here to then be logged onto our spreadsheet. And so I'm assuming yes. that you have a similar process like that. Yeah, so we have like a a waiting to be written up bin, which yep. yes, we have that too. <laughs> the gal who does most of our writing up works three or four days a week. So it doesn't wait very long. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, like I said, some days we might get a hundred pieces come in the door. Like another day we might only get one. You just don't know. Um, and so it sits there and then it comes back. And the next thing is that we sort it. So sitting yes. in there, I've got these bins right next to me. Um, it says leather finisher, belts, finishing that needs embroidery, stockings and pillows, finishing with no embroidery. So it all gets sorted here Yep. for the next step, which generally is logging it into the spreadsheet and assigning it to a finisher, which yep. kind of happens simultaneously. That's right. Because yes, yes, yes. Different mm -hmm. finishers specialize in different types of things. Yeah. So we have people who come in. I'm glad you brought that up because we have people who come and say, well, isn't the finisher working on? And it's like, we do not have one finisher. And it, we have, just like you do, we have someone who only does stockings. We have someone who only does belts. We have someone who only does specialty belts. We have, you know, and so right. depending on the pipeline, as I used the term earlier, that finisher may be working faster or ahead of date versus another finisher. And I hope right. I'm not jumping ahead um, on your notes here because Melissa is the organized one, as you all, if you've been listening to us for a hot second, you know that she's always more organized than I am. Well, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> so, I'm, anyway. I'm going down all the chaotic rabbit holes today. So we're maybe doing role reversal because that's usually <laughs> you and you're keeping me on track. So, oh boy. Oh boy. Um, yeah. So once we, um, so writing up is also like a deciphering process because um, we try to educate everyone in the proper terminology. And I know you and I have done podcast episodes before when we've talked about pillows where this is a gusseted finish, this is a knife edge finish, all those things. So we're trying to educate people as we go, but sometimes the writing up process is a little bit of a, what does this person really want? And that's, that's where right. the phone calls come into play mm -hmm. to have a, you know, back and forth on what, what we're really after here. Um, yep. And then, yeah, so then we channel it into all that. Um, embroidery, do you have someone who just does embroidery for you? We have three. <clears throat> okay, we do so I've a got a lot of embroidery. <laughs> uh, yes, Kirsty told me that, what did she tell me? I think she said she just sent 300 pieces to our embroidery gal, and that was just like three or four weeks of deliveries. Yeah, Crazy. it's a lot, but but I want to point something out, and I think this is the point that you're getting to. Uh, and I love when I say I want to point that out because you know I we are the laugh. pointing it out podcast. Um, <laughs> anywho, the um the embroiderer is not the finisher. No, so the embroiderer is the embroiderer. So that's step one. And, and in they fact, have special machinery, but there's a lot of prep that even goes into getting things to. I that was just about person. to say that. So you yeah. we can't send anything to the embroiderer until we pull the appropriate fabric for the piece of the end product. So, yes. um, so you can, we can't just drop all of, cause also I imagine you've got a bag for every 
It's like we have everything's in its own like project bag, essentially. And um, so that project bag can't just go direct to the to the embroiderer. You have to have the appropriate embroidery. And guess what sometimes also happens? I'm going to out myself or ourselves. Sometimes we don't send the right kind or enough because maybe mm -hmm. we didn't read and they say, I want the embroidery on the toe of the stocking. And it, we usually do it on the middle of the stocking. So the piece we sent isn't the right or it's velvet and it's going the wrong way because we are not seamstresses around here. And the, the right. um, what's that called? Not the grain, the, um, the, the, uh, mm -hmm. has a name. Yes. I'll think of it. I know it'll come to one of us in a second, not the weave, but anywho, it's going like, say the wrong direction. Um, that's important too. And so, um, and also keep in mind that we're sort of turning and burning. We're like grabbing the color and the thing that we think looks the best. And we're doing a lot of those things. Um, and we're just going too fast. Um, and so anyway, yeah, so that's the, my piece the about embroidery. <laughs> the embroidery has, um, we're fortunate because we just have one person. So that, that makes it a little bit simpler because then we're not dividing that up. But before it can go there, we are writing up the embroidery separately so that that piece of paper travels with the fabric that my finishing manager or one of my assistants to the finishing manager have selected. Then they're selecting the font and yep. they're selecting the color of thread. There's like a whole little book of different colors, threads, and it's crazy. So all of those- And if it's all capital letters or if it's not, and has it been written the way that describes exactly what the customer wants that goes to the embroiderer? So I'm sorry, yeah. we're going down a rabbit hole, but yeah. I think people so understand a, that there's a there's huge process a just for embroidery. embroidery. Yeah. So, yeah. So what travels to the embroidery person is just the, the paperwork and a piece of fabric. Like you're in our world, at least the needle point itself doesn't go to the embroiderer. That stays and is stored in the building. Again, I'm, I'm more well. Sometimes, but sometimes they have to know where the embroidery goes to match the piece. So I think I'll be, I'm be honest. I'm not exactly sure. No, I I know because we have a bin that says waiting to come back from the embroiderer. That's why I know that. <laughs> <laughs> look so, at you being um, observant and well and it's also again back to the liability like I would yes. rather know I've got a lot of insurance I don't know if all my finishers have like enough insurance if everything goes wrong so everything is a is 1500 pieces or 2000 pieces but most of my uh, finishers only have 20 to 40 things at any one moment in time. So That's they right. have enough mm -hmm. insurance for that. They probably don't have enough insurance for this. <laughs> that makes sense. That's exactly right. Yes, I completely so, agree. Um, so then that comes back from the embroiderer. We rematch up the fabric, the now embroidered fabric with the finishing piece. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a position to um, send things out to our different finishers. And when we send them out depends on their timing, right? How many things they have. Cause again, I don't want them having more than 20 to 40 items in their possession. It's overwhelming to them. Um, again, liability, sorry, I keep bringing that up, but that's well, how much we true. care about it. That's right. You know, the other thing so, I want to mention, and maybe you're getting to this too, is that sometimes people will send us fabric and uh, sometimes, um, and so I both love and despise when people send us fabric because sometimes it's the wrong weight. Sometimes it's the wrong amount. Sometimes um, there's, did I say no, amount? Um, and here's the problem. We, we, uh, we're making this like the life cycle as if it's all happening in one day. Like it goes to this <laughs> bin and then that bin and this bin. We may or may not even get a piece to the embroiderer or to the finisher until six months, maybe sometimes just depending on the piece. And I, I'm just, I just threw that out there. It could be eight weeks. Um, but we're not even going to pick that bag back up and double check that is the right amount of fabric until much later, at which point maybe you can get more of that fabric. Maybe you can't, maybe the dye lot has changed. Um, and so I think sometimes customers do get frustrated when we've, you know, there's a, a period of time between when we receive, when we choose the fabric and then when we get it, but we try our best to actually choose the fabric when it's going to the finisher so that we know right. we, we have enough that we have, you know, the, again, the right dye lot, the right direction of the plaid, the plaids can match, you know, sometimes you need like the plaids and the stripes have to have even right. more um, right. when you're doing a ruffle, you need like three times as much as you need. And so um, self-welting has to go on the bias. So that takes that's right. up gobs of fabric. 
That's right. And so it's not that we're um, being errant or um, forgetful or any of those things. It's just that there's a reason why we wait until not the 11th hour, but until the item is really ready to be actively um, worked on. Um, so well, I let, wanted to get that Let's there. talk about that fabric <laughs> thing. So I'm sitting in this corner with all this fabric. My fabric okay. is behind me uh, in bins. Poor Mary probably wants some privacy back there, but we should share some pictures well, because it is it is organized chaos. <laughs> well, let's talk about this. This is not enough fabric to do all our finishing. That's exactly right. Thanks At for all. bringing that up. So my finishing manager um, is also one of my finishers, um, but she's also my finishing manager, which is, makes her a little different from how you function just because I got lucky and that's how it is. Um, and she's phenomenal. I have to mention, even though she says she doesn't listen to the podcast, so, she, so I'm not even going to get get kudos for saying she's phenomenal. But <laughs> she's phenomenal. Um, but she individually shops for the fabric, the trim, the um, cording, uh, the twisted cord, the pearl cottons that we use, um, the pillow inserts. I don't know. There was a big box of pillow inserts behind me. I think I moved those. Um, all of those things. And when I say she shops for them, sometimes we get lucky and it's in the building because she knows fabrics like some good basic like Dupioni silks and velvets that we use over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. But I'm shaking um, my head. For those of you listening, I'm ardently yes. shaking my head, agreeing with everything that Melissa is saying. <laughs> but then we have wholesale accounts set up with different fabric mills and different trims. And so these trims behind me are not because I stock them because I think they're cute, even though I do. Um, <laughs> it is because when you order fabric or trims, you're required to order a minimum amount of yardage. So right. you might only need a yard for Sue's pillow, but Sue's pillow really is screaming to have this very particular trim on it. So we have to order five yards. So mm -hmm. then it sits here mm -hmm. and we hope we can use it again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, um, it, it's a lot of labor. It's a lot of um, educated work. I mean, I couldn't do what Kirsty does to save my life. No way. Um, she knows exactly when she's, someone says, oh, I'd like a mixed color brush trim. She's like, oh, I know the company that carries that. I've got it. And she pulls out some magic little trim book, then picks something. And, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it, she's amazing. So uh, that whole, I think there's a, an an image of most finishing uh, rooms having just like endless amounts of fabric. Um, and no, we're not, we're not Santa Claus's um, North Pole house. That's teeny tiny on the outside and giant on the inside. We're just teeny tiny. So I think the other thing is we just don't simply have the space. And, um, right. and again, I don't want to jump ahead on your notes here, but um, keep in mind that most needlepoint stores have limited real estate. So in other words, the amount of space you have to display your wares, which is the lifeline of your business, the, the actual retail operation um, of, of inventory needs to really have the most uh, FaceTime, if you will. Right, right. Um, and so the last thing we want to do is create a whole bunch of space that we have limited anyway, any, in, in the first place, to then allocate that to storage. Because that's not making us any money. <laughs> and so, we need to keep so the lights turned on. <laughs> there there may have been a day. <laughs> Do you guys remember? Um, I say you guys because people are listening. Um, and I'm Midwestern and that's what we say instead of y'all. Um, Do you remember the movie Mommy Dearest? No. Joan Crawford. And no. she's like, no more wire hangers. No. Okay. Like, <laughs> like classic, like, I think that was like late 70s. That movie came out. Uh, it was actually kind of terrible because it was about what a terrible mother she is. And I don't know anything about her. So <laughs> I'm not making a judgment. But yes, she would there's get a needlepoint canvas of her. Yes, 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 yes. So her no more wire hangers. I think there was a day where I was like, no more pillows. <laughs> because we, for whatever reason, at that point in time, Kirstie had ordered a gob of pillow inserts. Well, they're big. They're cumbersome. Yes. We have no space. I'm like, there's no room, more room at the end. You can't order any more pillows. So she's laughs at me now. But in her she, defense, she had to do that because she probably yes, had a minimum or she had a exactly. pipeline of pillows that all needed the same size insert. And so exactly. she had to do it. And then, you know, and you were sort of like stuck with it. Right. Well, it and, was and, not my best moment. I'm making fun of myself as you can no, see. No, I know you are, but I, <laughs> but I understand what you're saying because as the business owner, you're saying, I can't put this out in the middle of the floor. This is just in the way. These are ugly boxes, but we have to have these to essentially 
feed the piece of the business that's really re generating the least amount of revenue. Um, and that's just because of markup. Um, right. And I don't know if you want to transition into that piece of this or not um, yet, but. Um, well, let, let's, uh, yeah, we can do it. Since, since we brought it up, let's keep going. So there are, you know, kind of baseline uh, industry standards for markups in retail. And I think both of us kind of run the front of the house at the kind of standard in, standard retail markups that allow you to turn on your lights, pay your rent, pay your 18 employees, all those things. Right. Um, finishing markups are far, far, far lower. They're probably anywhere from half to two thirds of right. what a normal markup would be for a retail product. So from a business perspective, um, Megan was right back at the beginning when she said, I'm never doing finishing because <laughs> it is a losing battle. Um, you are have gobs of labor as we've already, I mean, we haven't even talked about a finisher touching it yet. And you guys right, have already right. heard how many times this piece has been touched. That's right. Uh, and so gobs and gobs of layer labor, lower markups, losing battle. But of course, you know, it's the frosting on the cake. Like you it have really to is. have it. You have and it to inspires, have it. it inspires people to be excited about either stitching the piece that they've seen finished or to continue going on their own stash or whatever it is. But, um, for sure, for I, sure. you know, I just want, because finishing is expensive and that's because it's a hand craft, but that just because it's expensive doesn't mean that we're actually making any money doing Correct. it. <laughs> I, I, I call mean, it the I, service part of our business because it really is a service that we're providing and, um, much less. Well, there's less another industry term called loss leader. And oh, so I yeah, would call it a, a good loss one. leader. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. In because as event. we mentioned, the amount of um, transactions that we're making in support of finishing is significant, but the right. amount of money that we're making. So yes, a loss leader. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Good term. So, as, um, as you might recall, Melissa's the business girl and I'm the <laughs> sales and marketing girl. <laughs> the financial, I should say, financial. And, Together um, we make a marketing. good team for sure. Um, <laughs> okay. So back to ordering all that things, not only are there minimum um, quantities you have to order, then the storage options, which we've kind of beaten like a dead horse. Yes. And uh, lots and lots of shipping costs involved in all of that. Because in the old days, there were, at least in the Detroit area, there were a lot of uh, fabric and trim places you could drive to and do like a big purchase and bring it home in your car. Um, all There's a Calico Corner or Calico now, um, that used to be around the corner. Now the closest one is like an hour and 15 minutes. So it doesn't make any sense unless my finishing manager happens to be out there for another reason for mm -hmm. her to go to the shop because it's, mm -hmm. you know, two and a half hours round trip. Right. So um, we've got one place that we can go to for some things, but you know, it, it's a little bit like um, going to TJ Maxx and finding the good stuff amongst all the not good stuff right. kind of right, things. Right, so, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. In any event. Um, so Lots of that involved there. Um, let me but see. But you were saying shipping and are you, are you getting to the point that, so not all of our finishers are local to us. Many so of yeah, them so are. So then once mm -hmm. everything's logged, so we have the finishing costs of materials coming in. Mm -hmm. Then um, we are fortunate enough to have like, I'm looking five of our finishers that are local to us that either travel to us or we drop off and pick up from them. But we have 15 others that we have to ship things to, because this is a very specialized um, yeah. skill. So, and I would say we're probably closer to 15 local, uh, locally. Oh, because oh, you said you had, so talk about that. You said that there's a uh, old uh, organization in St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing that we've done, so um, I don't know that we're really going to really get into the weeds on this, but as all of you know, Needlepoint blew up during COVID. Everybody was stitching, a lot of stitching. And so everyone was drinking from a fire hose at the end, like when the world opened back up. And so, so these 1900 pieces didn't happen overnight, but they started to build up. Um, the, I'll be honest. I mean, I think when I first bought the shop, we maybe had like a hundred pieces under management at any one time. I had we, three, three finishers when I bought the shop. Now I have 20. Right. And, and that's so, out of necessity. <laughs> that's exactly right. And so um, we've had a couple retire here, you know, pe pe anyway. Um, and so I kept saying to myself, we have got to be able to solve this problem. Like there's got to be a way to solve this problem. And I know Melissa did too. And other, others of our colleagues that I'm not, we're, we can only just speak from our own perspective, right, which is right. why I'm not um, uh, talking about anybody else. But so 
I, I kept saying, there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. And so we've kind of gotten creative. Um, we have a couple, we have gone to a couple of interior design firms who have um, workrooms. And so we found some people that way. But one thing that I did um, is uh, we have something called the city sewing room. And so it's a resource cool. for people. Yeah, it's very cool. It's, it's a resource in a lot of different ways, but it's a nonprofit. And one day I said, let's, well, first of all, I think we were going to shop because they have like a, like a, um, a donation center where people will bring. And so you can find some really cool, like vintage fabrics and things. But I was like, there's gotta be like a group of people that sew here or something. And so what they had was like a community board, you know, like when you go into a, a coffee shop and people say like babysitting or dog sitting or whatever, well, there were, there were sewers, um, seamstresses and they're not all, um, seamstresses. There's also men, um, but people who are sewing and people who have capabilities. What are they um, called? Seamsters? Taylor, maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. Uh, anyway, it's, you know, I was almost a linguistics major, so I should know this, but well, that's go cool. ahead. <laughs> uh, anyhow. And so I, I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate that we're doing the best we can to, to use our resources. And so I, we found a couple of business cards. We grabbed a couple of business cards and we have since been able to teach those people to take their develop craft, them. well, develop them, but to use the craft that they already had, but to, um, apply it to needlepoint. And, um, you know, but again, that's not easy because I've been buying pieces off of eBay or using my own personal things because we're not just going to throw, you know, Correct. customer Sue's piece to this new person that we're trying to develop. So that has to happen right. over time. Um, we also have had some of our finishers work together to try to teach each other or to talk about right. techniques, but again, they're coming in at different times or they're in different States. And so, um, and, guess what? They're also working. <laughs> so it's hard to get together to have this like collaborative, like educational thing. So, um, so yeah, so, so we're doing the best we can to like use some of our resources. And I know you've done a great job with networking among your finishers, like saying, Hey, do you have a friend right. who might be interested in learning this? Um, and so yeah, we, we're we constantly have like trying to develop group of gals on the West side of the state. It started out with one. And then she had a friend who had a friend and they and they all teach each other. My finishing manager goes out and meets with them every so often. And but um, I have two two gals that are going out on maternity leave at the same time mm. this summer, which is really disappointing. And my it's very exciting manager, for them, Melissa. It's, it's not very exciting for them. They're having babies. The timing, for sake. I know it's <laughs> fabulous. Um, the timing is disappointing for us as a business. Right, uh, right, 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 right. But as I said to Kirsty, we can't control that, and that's the reason many shops um, and our shop in the days of yore had a finishing deadline, where yes. you know. And this is laughable. It used, when I first bought the shop, if you turned in your finishing by October 15th, you'd have it in time for Christmas. <laughs> Isn't that cute? That is so and, cute. And <laughs> um, probably, I can't remember if it was two or three years ago, I'm like, and we, of course, we kept backing up that date, backing right, up that right, date, right, right. of course. But we have, as we talked about at the beginning, we don't know if one piece is walking in the door today or 30. Like, you never know what's happening. And you don't know how that pipeline is going to grow or shrink, for that matter. Yes. And so about three years ago, we started saying, we don't have a finishing deadline anymore. We now have a finishing time frame. And yeah. I know that that's probably disappointing to many stitchers. But I had a year where one of my finishers, husbands, and my finisher was 30, passed away. Another mm -hmm. finisher had a stroke in December. Like mm -hmm. all these things were happening. And I'm like, these are people who have real lives. This is not like watching a machine do something. Like, right, right. So life happens to my finishers. And I, as much as I need to take care of my customers, I need to take care of my finishers. And, th and I'm like, I can't put the stress on them anymore. Like mm -hmm. they're working really hard. It's not like, because now we went, we've gone to timeframes versus a deadline. It's not like they're not working hard now. Right. They're, right. They're still working. Just <laughs> we kind of have like internal, like we'd love this set of things back by this date. Like we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but the, um, so the timeline fluctuates and we post that on our website once a month, we update it. I know you said you have a board in your shop that you update weekly. Um, and it just kind of gives you a general idea of how long a certain type of finishing is going to take. Um, like yeah, and the other thing um, that I want you said that kind of uh, um, brought a thought to my head was the fact that you have like a finisher who went on another finisher who did this. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean that you can just shift that pipeline of items over to um, 
the other finisher or whatever. Because first of all, there is a part of the craft that is all um, machine sewn. So clutches, pillows, lots of things are machine sewn. But there's another um, huge, huge part of it of our finishing craft that is hand sewn. And if you tell a machine sewer to do some hand sewing, they're going to look at you like you have four heads. Like that is no, those two things just don't always compute. Now, sometimes it does. So we have people who are very, very crafty. Kiersey, I'm sure is one of them. She can do just about anything. There's a few different Correct. finishers who can do all those things, but we have honed some skills with particular finishers, or we have determined have that specialties. a finisher has a specialty and that's what they're good at. They may even have patterns for them. So for example, our stocking finisher, she knows when she gets a Susan Roberts stocking or a Liz, or I mean, a, um, a least, or I mean, I, um, what am I trying to say? A, a strictly Christmas. They all have different shapes. She's got patterns for all of those. So she can whip through stockings really quickly. Well, yes, my pillow finisher who who primarily focuses on pillows could stitch a stocking, but it's going to take her three times as much um, time because, right. you know, she ha- doesn't have the patterns and the, like the efficiency that the other person does. So just like, I've, I'm feeling for you on these two women who are going to be out because something tells me that, you know, one of those women is are really good at, um, yeah. gusset and ornaments. And the other one is like, Oh, I got to do a gusset and ornament today. And maybe somebody knows how to do the 3d shape. And, um, yeah. and we're trying <clears throat> to get some of the gals up to speed on our standups because the, we have probably four people who do standups, but the two that are going on maternity leave are two of the four that do the standups. So we're trying right. to get others up to speed, but to your point, that doesn't happen overnight. Like that's, that's right. That's mm-hmm. something we started working on as soon as we heard that they were both going to be on maternity leave, but seven mm-hmm. months does not a finisher make. <laughs> right, right. And I, I, I want to say something else. And again, I'm not sure if I'm jumping the gun because here I am not looking at the thing, but I, I don't know so where we are what we, what we're ta- what you and I are talking a lot about is these um, sort of, as you, you called it, I think cottage industry or individuals who are working from their homes. So yes. I would tell you that probably 17 out of our 20, if we're, if I'm just doing round numbers, are those type of people. Um, we also access skill and um, labor from these larger um, finishing operations. So um, there, there's one in Texas, there's a couple in Oregon, there's uh, a couple in California, these larger operations that take in all the kinds of finishing and you're working with one intake person. So, you know, the leader of the, of the group, just call it. And then he or she is then distributing the workout to their worker bees um, opposed to, you know, like having those people in their individual homes. And some of those places um, I've talked to, and because, you know, I ask a million questions all the time, because I'm always very fascinated by processes. um, But some of those people have uh, some of those 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 businesses have acquired machinery that allows them to do some of these processes faster. But that right. also means that they've had a big um, um, investment of machines, and they're also managing a crew of people, which means that they have uh, payroll and they've got insurance and all these right. things. And so sometimes those operations are a little more expensive. They might be faster, but they're a little more expensive because of the amount they have to charge in order to um, essentially wholesale it to us. Right. And so that's right. also one of the reasons why you're going to see not only um, changes in um, pricing of things across the country. I mean, we we know that something in New York City is going to cost more than it's going to cost in, um, you know, DeKalb, Illinois, <laughs> or, or St. Louis, or Detroit, or, um, but you also have to um, think about the fact that there are some businesses that are operating to mass produce that are Right. And, and like I said, we use a couple of them. I know some stores across the country only use the larger Correct. finishing houses, if you will. I don't know what else to call them. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, it's diverse. There's a lot of right. different pieces to this finishing. Well, we're all just kind of getting it done the best way each of us has found to get it done. Yeah, that's right. Is it all the same? Um, Okay, so we'll just finish the life cycle because I think we've we've covered a lot of territory. But um, once everything goes out to our finishers, it comes back. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, God, what has been watching out for us? Um, <laughs> we've never had a box of finishing lost. I'm so happy to report. Um, so, but every time you know it's traveling around, it a lot of insurance gets thrown on those boxes. 
uh, and it comes back. It has to get logged back in. It gets logged in through the through the spreadsheet. It gets priced. Um, in Megan's and my situation, we show it off because we have found over COVID that people loved the experience of feeling like they're in a local needlepoint shop. So they get their moment of fame. Um, but I will add don't. something. We sometimes we just can't show all of it. What well, that's what I say. Sometimes <laughs> they don't because there's either too much or it's something that was time sensitive and we would never hold something up to show it off. Um, you know, if it's the week before 4th of July, the second a patriotic piece comes in, it's out the door. Right. Uh, right. So it doesn't get held up for that. It also, um, if we get 5,000 stitched angels back the same day that all the stitched angels aren't going to get shown off, like all those things. So it gets shown off then we have to invoice it. So we utilize um, our Shopify platform to, to um, send people invoices just because that lays it all out for them. What they're paying, they can see it um, rather than getting a phone call, which it's harder to pass along all that information. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give them the opportunity to decide how much insurance they want on it because mm -hmm. now that's up to them. Um, I will point out, there I go, I said it, um, that- well done. <laughs> uh, the insurance on the back end, when something, if, if Megan sent something to me for finishing, when I sent it to her, all she can get back is the cost she can prove that she put into it. So right. the cost of the canvas, the cost of the threads, the cost of the finishing. If it took you two years to stitch that gigantic pillow, they, they're not going to pay you for your time. So right. think about that insurance amount because you can insure it for $1,200, but if you can only prove $600 of expenses, that's all you're going to get back. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and honestly, I probably, I think we ship 50 plus packages every day. Not mm -hmm. all of it's finishing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and anytime I get a notice that something's been lost, I, I kind of go, like, I think I, you know, I have to keep yeah. my hand over my mouth in case I'm going to throw up. Um, and I'm always so relieved when I see it's just product. And um, we have probably had in the course of eight years, two pieces of finishing that has been lost and never shown up. Sometimes it's lost and shows up four weeks later and that's right. still not even very right. often. Right. So. And, 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 you know, that's a pretty good track record, especially um, considering that over the course of time, you've the pack, the amount of packages you're shipping grows. And so therefore the right. percentage of things that get lost grows. Um, the other thing I want to say just to mention, and I know people know this, but I've had to say it a couple of times to people, there are situations where and this has happened to me a couple of times with shipping too. And I'm just pointing this out because um, it's sad, but it's true. The The shipping service is going to do anything they can to prove that they did their job. So if for some reason it says delivered, but the person never received it, it either got stolen off their porch or it was delivered to the wrong address or whatever it is, um, we're, we're still liable because we cannot get our insurance back because they're saying we did our job. It, we have proof that we did our job. Um, so there have been a couple of times when we... As small business owners, we just have to eat that. I mean, as a good customer service, uh, you know, um, operation, we just say, you know what, we're never going to get any money back from the shipping service. And frankly, you'll never get as much as you really, especially if it's a, it's a finishing piece, you're never going to get to your point what you deserve back anyway. Um, so we do anything we can to help with three stitching or, you know, whatever we need to do. But by and large, things end up showing up. It's weird. It's right. really weird. I know. But it's like you start going down that rabbit hole of, okay, how do we need to recreate this package? And then it shows up. So yeah, thank the Lord. I, like I but... <laughs> said, and, and we've had some things missing that, like I said, six weeks later, like someone's husband who lives next door stuck in a closet. And, right, right. You know, or the or UPS just discovers it or USPS just discovers it. So um, for the most part, things show up and they get there safely. Um, we had a customer post a video the other day opening her, their box of finishing uh -huh. and all these people were like, oh, it was packed so beautifully. So um, I don't know if I can say every package is packaged beautifully here uh, because I'm very, you guys have heard me talk about this, like I'm so like, I want to be earth friendly. So mm -hmm. they're packed nicely, but most importantly, they're packed very securely and safely. And that's another huge time pressure like so our finishing shipping might not go out as quickly as our product shipping because a canvas i can slide into a stay flat out the door it goes finishing requires a lot of time and care 
the to right package size it of well. box, the right and sometimes amount we of have packaging. to order a box because <laughs> it's an odd shaped thing and we don't stock that size box. So yeah. So yeah, just another little uh, you know, but, I hope that we've covered, I mean, I don't know where we are in our timeline here. I feel like um, I think we've, gotten, we've done yeah, the best the thing we was shipping it and filing insurance claims when needed. So there well, we look go. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, so, you know, it. it's um, it's a topic that is robust, obviously, because we've spent an entire hour talking about it almost. I know. Um, it's and a topic Kel that's... Kelly, Kelly Watley is probably like, why did I ask this question? <laughs> I hope everybody but learned something. You, Kelly. <laughs> um, but, you know, as always, we love when people put comments in the comment boxes because it helps remind us either that we forgot to say something or that we want to um, tease that out a little bit more. So always know that we're working um, to keep in touch. Um, and especially now that we have our marketing assistant, she's doing a great job of keeping we us love Rebecca. up to date and on our by the way, Rebecca is a stitcher and she goes to Stitch Club and her Stitch Club gives her ideas for us. Oh, I, mean, I love it's it. Fabulous. It's, it's fabulous. It's awesome. I'm going to get to meet her in person. What? I'm going, yeah. I'm going, well, I have to go to Florida again. You know, it's not always yeah. a vacation when I go to Florida. But um, we have talked. She's uh, She lives about an hour. Actually, she lives where my in-laws used to live. And um, so she's about an hour from where I'll be. So we're going to meet up while I'm there. So That's I'm excited amazing. to meet her in real life. So Yay. yeah. Very good. Well, um, that was fun, Melissa. And if it nothing was. else, it was fun to be together again. So here, no, I'm, I do miss you, my friend. Uh, same, so. but guess what? Uh, the podcast retreat's coming up. We're not too far away. So we'll get together. Actually, yeah. markets before that. I know we're going to see each other in a couple of weeks, but we don't see much of each other there either. Let's admit we're both True running story. around like chickens. <laughs> yes. Yes. Crazy, crazy times, but, um, but we're excited. Yeah. And so be sure to, to, um, subscribe on whatever podcast platform, audio or visual that you're, you're joining us here with. I hope we did a pretty good job of describing things. We're still working on that. That's still something that I've got in the back of my head because a lot of you have joined us on our audio platforms, which we are delighted to have you. Um, but yeah, I think that that wraps us up for today. I think we did it. All we will right. chat soon, my dear. Take care. Sounds great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.